Let's talk turkey. Some books stand out from the flock, while others fly under the radar. Bird books can easily fall into either of those two categories. Today I'm giving you a bird's eye view of six books where winged creatures play a major or minor role. Up first is Migrations by Charlotte McConaughey. Ever heard of an arctic tern? I hadn't either until I read this atmospheric eco-fiction novel. Birds? Yeah, birds. The book opens with a couple of haunting lines. It says, The animals are dying. Soon we will be alone here. And that sets the less than cheerful tone you can expect throughout this book. That sounds like a lot of fun. So, in a world where animal life is disappearing from the earth, we meet Franny Stone. She's a mysterious, troubled woman who's gone to Greenland in order to track the final migration of the Arctic terns before they go extinct. On the way of the dodo. It's quite the mission since Arctic terns complete the longest migration of any living creature, basically going from North to South Pole. In this setting decimated by climate change, Franny talks her way onto a boat that's heading south. But as she tracks the birds, she's also trying to escape a dark past, one that's slowly starting to catch up with her. What some readers may struggle with is how Franny isn't a likable character. She's aloof, guarded, and lonely, with inner demons that are still causing her pain. I, I have a, a secret. And while her motives to observe this incredible natural feat are noble, it feels like her quest is pointless, which I think is the tough, conservationalist pill the author wants us to swallow. It's a call to act now, before it's too late. Can't talk, saving the planet. Up next is Mozart's Starling by Leanda Lynn Hopped. European starlings are one of the most hated birds on the planet. Why? Well, in North America, they're an invasive species that have displaced other native birds. They were released into New York City in the late 1800s and have been causing problems ever since. They're loud and aggressive with corrosive droppings uh, that damage stuff and spread weed seeds. And farmers dislike them because they like eating grain crops too. Nobody likes you. So with that information, let's travel back in time to 1784 when the composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart Amadeus. became enamored with a common European starling after it chirped a version of the theme from his Piano Concerto No. 17 in G. That was that decision made, he took it home as a pet, and for three years it kept him company becoming a tiny part of his family. Running parallel to this story of Mozart is The Author's Tale, which she also rescued a starling that she named Carmen. And it's a small bird with a big personality that, like in Mozart's life, became a charming little companion. There's some factual evidence provided, but Hopped does try to fill in a bit of the blanks about the bird and its relationship with Mozart. Based on research, and her own experiences. Now, is this all of it true? Definitely not, but it does make you stop to consider how creative geniuses are impacted by their surroundings. We hear these stories all the time about how some minor detail stirred the imagination, leading to a major scientific discovery or iconic work of art. Eureka! There are nuggets of truth there. One thing to note, though, is that this book jumps around a lot. Hopped goes over the history of starlings, their vocal skills, and their impact on us two-legged humans. And like I mentioned earlier, it shows us a snapshot from Mozart's life, trying to answer the question, how much did this smart little starling influence Mozart's music? It's a neat read, especially if you're interested at all in classical music, Austrian child prodigies, or the bad boys of the bird world. Up next on my list is George, a magpie memoir by Frida Hughes. In this book, the author recounts in great detail her experience rescuing and raising a magpie she named George. We get to see George grow up and witness his intelligence, whether it be escaping from his enclosure or exploring his surroundings. The author's little creature family includes three dogs and George, with Hughes cherishing the moments when all of them are snuggled up together on her couch. It's a daily look at George's growth physically, mentally, and socially. He's initially 100% reliant on the author, but grows up in a matter of months. 
I proclaim this the summer of George! And everyone who interacts with George, aside from the author, is either fascinated by him or revolted by him. And honestly, I would be weirded out if I came to a lady's house and there was a bird hopping around me, pecking at my stuff, and pooping on me. And yes, there's a lot of attention on George's pooping habits, and way too many details. I understand the author is trying to capture the reality of the situation, but man, someone needs to teach birds how to use toilets. That's just nasty. If you're a fan of an author seeing the amazing in the everyday mundane things, this book might be at the top of the pecking order. Next up is Untethered Sky by Fonda Lee. At only 152 pages, Untethered Sky is the hummingbird of avian fiction. Oh, teeny tiny! But it features giant fictional hunting birds called rocks. If you're intrigued by falconry or the ancient practice of Eurasian hunters training and using eagles to kill prey, you need to get your talons on this fantasy novella. Esther's family was torn apart when a manticore killed her mother and baby brother, leaving her with nothing but her father's painful silence and an overwhelming desire to kill the monsters that took her family. Revenge is a dish that is best served cold. Esther's path leads her to the King's Muse, where the enormous rocks of legend are flown to hunt manticores by their brave and dedicated rookers. Paired with a fledgling rock named Zara, Esther finds purpose and acclaim by devoting herself to a calling that demands absolute sacrifice in a creature that will never return her love. The terrifying partnership between woman and bird leads Esther not only on the Empire's most dangerous manticore hunt, but on a journey of perseverance and acceptance. Fifth on my list is 438 Days by Jonathan Franklin. This is a true story of Salvador Alvarenga, who was supposed to go fishing off the coast of Mexico for a couple of days, but his boat's engine died and he drifted out to sea. Over the course of a year and two months, Salvador was carried 9,000 miles away. That distance is equal to going from New York to Moscow, and then back. During his time on the open ocean, Salvador had to fend off sharks, catch fish and turtles with his bare hands, collect rainwater, and try to maintain his sanity. So why am I including this survival book in a list of recommendations about birds? Well, this book really stuck with me for lots of reasons. Uh, but one of the main ones was how Salvador survived by catching and eating raw birds. Now, the graphic nature of this might unsettle some people, but the dude was just trying to stay alive. He did what he had to do. In fact, he actually befriended one of these birds. He talked to it in order to keep his mind sharp. However, after an unlucky fishing streak, his hunger won out. Sorry, bird lovers. And last but not least is A House with Good Bones by T. Kingfisher. Vultures play a small but important role in this gothic horror novel in which the main character, Sam, is furloughed from an archaeological dig. That belongs in a museum! So she returns home to North Carolina to crash for a couple of months in her mom's house, which was Sam's grandmother's house before that. When Sam arrives home, though, her mom is acting weird in a lot of different ways. There are strange things happening in the neighborhood, and Sam is starting to hear, see, and feel things herself. Also, vultures are perching nearby and watching her house. Then there's this quote from the book about our scavenger bird friends. It says, Vultures are extremely sensitive to the dead, particularly when the dead are doing things they shouldn't be. Okay, so having a one-winged pet vulture like one of the book's characters does may be a good idea. I don't usually read horror books because I'm a scaredy cat, but this one had just the right amount of spookiness. Trust me, it'll give you goosebumps. Or in this case, vulture bumps, I guess. There you have it, six bird books worth crowing about. Let me know if you can think of any others, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Happy reading.